Hello, everyone. This is Steve Zerker. I'm the host of Looking to the East, a twice monthly program that I host where we focus on topics mostly looking at Japan, but also more broadly to Asia. So thank you for tuning in. We're very fortunate today to have one of my favorite people in the world uh, with us. She's the former Consul General in Osaka Kobe for the United States. <clears throat> she served uh, in that position for three years, uh, terminating in August of last year. So she's been back in the States for the last year or so. Karen um, was uh, just a wonderful Consul General. I was the Vice President of the American Chamber of Commerce in Kansai, so we often were at similar events uh, presenting, usually Karen presenting before me uh, because of her her higher status than, than uh, <laughs> my, my role at the ACCJ was, was you know. But uh, Karen and I often spoke, and uh, Karen's uh, ideas were very similar to my own ideas. Often my speech was completely uh, negated because Karen's uh, presentation to the students or to the business community uh, was very similar. So that's kind of a joke that we share between the two of us. So I'm so happy, Karen, that you can join us. Uh, you look wonderful. It looks like your retirement is treating you well. Uh, Karen's Thank in you. California, in La Quinta, California, and you've been there now mm -hmm. for about, about a year or so. It's been about a year. It has been about a year. And thank you for the invitation. Yeah, it's, it's a, our pleasure, my pleasure indeed. All right, so um, let's uh, start by talking about, uh, I, I know my students and people in general, maybe younger people, are interested in a career in diplomacy. Uh, can you talk about how you got interested in working for the State Department? Was it something out of college or did you work in other positions and transition into the State Department? How did you get started on the journey that led to being the Consul General mm. in Osaka Kobe? Thanks. Thanks for the question. Let's see. Getting started, I think I think I would have to say that it started um, in a little bit of an indirect way. I graduated from university, um, was looking for an opportunity to work overseas. I, I knew I was interested in international affairs, and that was one of the degrees I earned um, at university was in international relations. Um, but I went to the Peace Corps. Um, oh, in West okay. Africa, I was a Peace Corps English teacher in a high school that was about, uh, I think, about 400 miles north of the capital uh, of Dakar uh, in Senegal, and uh, taught there for a couple of years, then went uh, at the end of my Peace Corps service, went to the capital, to Dakar, and uh, started working for the British Embassy in their culture and information section. Um, and it was as, uh, as an assistant to the cultural attache at the British Embassy that I met the secretary to the US ambassador who wanted to travel to the UK. And so I was handing out all kinds of travel information. We started talking and she noticed that my accent was not quite uh, British. <laughs> and um, we got into a conversation. I talked about my Peace Corps experience and the rest of it. And she invited me to lunch. And um, at the lunch, she pulled out a brochure. And I'll remember forever that the brochure title was Careers in the Foreign Service. And basically pitched the diplomatic service um, as an opportunity for me told me about uh, you know, the, the ability to travel overseas, to learn uh, foreign languages, to live in um, different cultures, and to support um, the, the foreign policy of the United States. And I took the brochure home after the lunch and, and looked through it and uh, really liked the descriptions that I saw um, mm -hmm. about this career and uh, decided that this was what I would try to do. Um, and it wasn't just, you know, a snap my finger and overnight I changed embassies. Um, it was a, it was a, from, from application to the first time I raised my hand to be sworn in as a, as a U.S. diplomat was about three years of time. And I believe wow. now that our foreign service has accelerated uh, the, uh, and shortened the time that it takes. Um, for entry, 
but this was way back when, um, over 30 years ago. So it was it was a laborious um, process then. Okay. Um, yeah, that was the start. Wow, that's uh, you must have been highly motivated. The three years is a long period of time to. to three wait. years is you a have long to, period of time. And you have to take a test, right? There's a very uh, difficult There's, test. There was a there was a there was a written test initially. And uh, the written test, if you're successful at the written test, um, at that time you were invited to come to Washington to take the oral examination, which is an all day, uh, which was an all day process. And um, wow, I by that time I had um, decided that I would uh, return to the U.S. So the the invitation to take the written exam in D.C turned out to be an invitation to return to, um, to return home. And I moved to the Washington DC area, um, took the exam and um, apparently did very well, uh, but there was more waiting. Now more paperwork and more waiting. Um, and so during that time I was working with a marketing firm in, um, in, the, in the DC metro area. Okay. Do you, if you pass the tests and, and the exams and so forth, do you go on the waiting list? You go on a so waiting you, list uh, okay. based on your, based on, based on the relative uh, success that you had in the different categories oh, of really? uh, specialty. Okay. Um, so there's an, you can do economic reporting or political reporting. Um, you can do culture and uh, information is a specific area that is management of mm -hmm. our facilities is another specific area. So you have right. a position on all of those waiting lists, but you may be higher on one list and lower on another. Um, so as the classes are formed um, for new diplomats, they will look at those lists and they'll go down those lists. We need, you know, we need another 10 economic reporters. So they'll look at the, who's, who's the highest, who are the 10 highest people on that list and they'll take, they'll invite those people to come and uh, join a class okay um, so it works that way so after three years you joined the the state department and where were you assigned first i guess probably back to africa since you had experience there or well you, you would Asia? have thought <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> you, you would have thought yeah <laughs> okay would, i would have gone straight to africa no my my first assignment was tokyo you and went to japan initially i wow. went to japan initially and had you uh, requested funny, that karen or was it I just did. Oh, you did? No, I did request it because oh, in, wow. the, okay. in the three years that I was working in the Washington, D.C. area, this was the period of, you know, Japan as number one, Japan oh, as yes. unfair trading partner, Japan right. and the, the Hondas and American oh, automobile, automobile well. yeah. workers smashing the Hondas with mallets and you know um right. it was that period the japan and that can't say I, no period the japan that can't say no they can say no oh yeah they could finally say no to the u.s i think that was the whole point of the book um yeah. but uh it was during that period and i was reading so much about this monolith japan um what i noticed though was that i i, I read very little almost nothing about Japan, the country, um, its culture, the people. I mean, those weren't the articles that were appearing in the Washington Post um, mm -hmm. uh, and other you know, major papers. They were all focused on this economic juggernaut um, mm -hmm. that, um, that we were trying to figure out as American uh, traders how to, how to manage mm -hmm. our relationship with Japan. And so I got I got curious about the country. So I started reading a little bit on my own mm -hmm. and um, finally decided that um, if I had an opportunity to go overseas again, I wanted to I wanted to go to Asia and I specifically wanted to go to Japan. Wow. And so when I came into the Foreign Service, they sit you down for a little interview right. and they've got your background. And so he's the the interviewers looking at my looking at my background and said you know we don't give our foreign service officers much choice in where they go but if you could choose anywhere in the world that you would like to go where would it be and I said mm. oh I'd love to go to Japan mm. and you know he looked at my 
my record again and thought, oh, <laughs> why Japan? <laughs> and I gave him that explanation I just gave you about right. not knowing anything about the people. I thought it was distressing that I was working and living in our nation's capital where mm -hmm. policy decisions are being made. Mm -hmm. And that I was learning so little about the Japanese people um, in that environment where we're making, you know, these momentous decisions about our relationship. And um, he, as as a consequence, he said, well, if you're if you're really interested in Japan, I've got some people I can introduce you to in the service. And so he started telling me, go look this person up or why don't you write, send that person an email and tell them about your interests. And, mm. and as it happened, I was basically introducing myself to the Japan community mm -hmm. um, that was in Washington at the department um, at that time. Mm. And so um, as it turned out, uh, Japan had a position for a new diplomat trainee wow. uh, to occupy for a few years. And I said, oh, there goes Good. my job. <laughs> I, just, I had no more sense than that. You know, it's kind of like, oh, look, they put it on the list for me. And wow. as it turned out, I was successful yeah. in, um, in getting Clearly. that first assignment. And um, it was, I mean, it was, it was a dream come, it was a dream come true. I so mean, Karen, when you yeah. arrived in Tokyo, and it's the mm -hmm. first time you've been there, right? You've first time right. you've been mm -hmm. there. You right. studied about it, but not actually physically lived there. Right. Was it difficult for you to adapt to, to I mean, many of the expat community does have issues as they go through the acculturation process. And I guess based on what you're saying, it, it, it looks like a duck taking the water. It sounds like you were, you know, maybe personality or properly prepared by the State Department in your own studies to really just hit the ground running in, in, uh, in Japan when you landed. I was really curious about Japan. I mean, I had developed this curiosity before the diplomatic service career. Um, mm. But um, I think that, you know, it, it was it was a combination of curiosity uh, leading me to all of this information and all of these people who were also enthusiastic about sharing Japan. Mm. Um, and really just, you know, going with an open mind. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that said, I have to say also, in all fairness, that you know, traveling as a member of the U.S. government is not a bad way to see the world. Um, you know, um, we have an, an embassy full of resources. And so, you know, unlike a lot of expats, um, I didn't have to find my own housing. Um, right. I, you know, had a home provided and all of the utilities already connected. I stood in no long lines in um, at utility companies um, or whatever we have to do now. Maybe you have to just go down to the Combini and uh, and register. But whatever it was that had to be done was done on my behalf. So I could focus on work and meeting people and doing the assignment that I had I, I had been given. So there's there's you know I have to I have to also credit the 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 the, the pillow that I was sitting on as I rode into town. Um, okay. for, <laughs> for clearing a lot of the hurdles out of the way. <laughs> yeah, and some but of yeah, the frustrations and moving to a new culture. Mm -hmm. Had you yeah. studied Japanese uh, through in preparing? I for this? had, I had, I had okay. some uh, preparation um, in Washington for the job, and that's the great thing about um, the diplomatic service is that our language training is built into our assignments. So if you are assigned to a country that has a language that you don't speak, um, the time to study that language before you um, go to that country is, is built into the job assignment. So it might, wow. be a, it might be a three year job assignment, but then prior to going, you have a year in Washington studying the language. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you're a full-time language student at our, at our language Institute, um, in Arlington, Virginia, but, um, you're also a full-time diplomat. So you're a salaried employee sent mm -hmm. to do this preparation, um, in advance of your assignment overseas. And I really liked that about the career as well. Yeah.
All right. Well, I, I know uh, we're, we're going to have to kind of fast forward because you had sure. many years intervening between when you landed in Tokyo. I know you were assigned in other countries and then you came back to Japan. I think you had three, right. three trips. But, but the last one, the one that I really want to talk about is as Consul General. So, um, you know, I, I, again, as I mentioned in the introduction, I, I watched you work and you were tireless on behalf of the country, the United States, and promoting the interest of the country. And Thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. It was just, uh, he was part of a long line. Alan Greenberg before you was, was mm. also the same. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, I think, is doing the same thing, our current Consul General. Excellent. But tell us about the job. Um, how did you get it? I mean, I, I, I hear through the through my buddies in mm -hmm. the consulate and the embassy that Japan's a tough, tough desk to get. Japan is tough. Um, the word is out. Uh, Japan. <laughs> How great it is! Yeah. <laughs> How great it is. The word is out. Japan is is one of the it's one of the nicest places um, you can go if you have uh, an interest in Asia. And um, in the Asia Pacific community of nations, um, Japan is a great is a great place to to kind of perceive what's going on in Northeast Asia, and uh, you know to jump off and vis make visits to to places in Southeast Asia as well. Um, so yes, there is a lot of competition for jobs when they open up in Japan, and for these what we call executive positions, consul general. Deputy Chief of Mission, those the number two in the in the in the embassy, those positions are highly bid, and there's a special committee that makes a selection for the appointment. Wow. Um, so basically, you do your best. You 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 submit a you submit a form, and um, you explain mm -hmm. why you think you are the person for the job. Mm -hmm. um, you are interviewed by people, and sometimes these are, I mean, these are happening, you know, at three in the morning because, right. because of all time differences. World. We're all right. over the world. Um, and then there's a decision that's made. And, um, and then uh, the appointment, you get the notice that you were successful or, um, you know, that, that your, your, your bid was not successful at that time. So I um, was really excited um, because uh, this, would, this was my fourth assignment in Japan. Four and times. Uh, oh, four okay. times, yes. Mm. And I was just, you know, I almost giggled to myself as I was writing my little, you know, pick me, pick me sheet, um, <laughs> my essay, um, thinking that no one in their right mind is going to send me back to Japan for a fourth <laughs> assignment. So I'm, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my name in the, in the, in the hat anyway. And, um, and I, you know, got the, got the response back and uh, the announcement uh, that uh, I had been selected for that position. I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled. And, um, you know, had three years that were really busy. I think we, we, we endeavored to do the best that we could to expand our relationship in Western Japan. Um, working with uh, the ACCJ, especially, um, you know, to expand the ties um, with the business community um, was something that, and then to, you know, connect the business community to our ambassador and uh, the folks in the embassy in Tokyo to see how, you know, the American um, government can support American business overseas. So it was, it was a great opportunity to travel. Um, Osaka is a big neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, the Kansai region is uh, 15 prefectures, and um, I'm happy to say I, I I nearly visited them all. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there was this there was a small issue of a pandemic that uh, slowed that me down slowed you there. Down. Oh, sure. At the end, but um, you know, it was just it was wonderful meeting people. It was wonderful having the opportunity to see Western Japan mm -hmm. um, in more detail than I would have as a tourist, certainly. Right. Um, I wouldn't have had a three-year tourism excursion in Japan, but if you ever hear of one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking out for you, Karen, you know that. <laughs> Please, <laughs> don't forget so, me. <laughs> no, that's, that's not possible. So I, I take it from the name, General, that mm. you are the head of the consulate itself. So all the other department, the, the commercial services and operations and uh, right. 
marketing, they all report to you? Is that how it works? We work as a team. Um, okay. They obviously um, have uh, offices at the embassy that uh, supervise uh, the details uh, of, of their activities. But in the consulate, we are, we are the team. Um, and for a better description, um, I can't think of right now, I'm the team leader. And um, mm. the idea is that we uh, collectively uh, come to an understanding of what our uh, leadership, our ambassador, and our country team in Tokyo um, is trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we look to see where there is complementarity with those goals in our efforts in Western Japan. And uh, then we try to pursue that. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, I, I know you're no longer officially in the State Department, but I want to spend the last few minutes of uh, this discussion talking about your observations of how the U.S.-Japan relationship is evolving under the, mm. the new president. Uh, you, when you were uh, Consul General, it was under a Republican administration, under President Trump right. mm -hmm. for that period of time, and we've gone through this transition um, starting uh, earlier this year. I, I'm sure you're paying attention. To, are you, do you still have access uh, to uh, State Department information, or are you? No? Okay. No, no, no. But as, no, a, no, as a personal citizen, retired. I'm sure, <laughs> sure you're watching yeah. it since you invested for Certainly. Four trips, for yeah. four, 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 four years, four year periods of time. Oh yes. my goodness! All right. Yeah. So no, what do you think? I think that you know the wonderful thing. One of the wonderful things about the U.S. Japan relationship is that it enjoys bipartisan support um, in our government, whether it's a Republican administration or a Democrat administration. Um, the it, the importance of the relationship that we have with Japan and its importance in establishing uh, peace and security throughout the um, Asia Pacific region, as well as what we do as a partner with Japan on a global um, on a global uh, scale, um, whether it's in global health, whether it is um, in um, aid uh, support to de uh, developing countries. Um, there is a lot that we do in science cooperation um, with the Japanese and space exploration. Um, mm -hmm. They are an important um, partner for us um, mm -hmm. I as Americans and as the U.S. government. And that doesn't change um, depending on the administration. Um, now, the approaches may change and there may be some emphases that are different from, it, uh, from Republican to Democrat or that are different from president to president. Mm. But um, what, I, what I have found um, across my experience um, working and living in Japan and representing the United States is that um, we, get, we get bipartisan support for the U.S.-Japan relationship um, in the U.S. government. And it, that, is a, that is a great thing um, for our relationship and for the business that we're trying to conduct. Yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, one thing that the current uh, folks that here in Japan are getting ready for is a new ambassador. Mm. Uh, Rahm Emanuel has been officially nominated by President mm -hmm. Biden, and I guess it's right. pending approval in the Senate. I know these things move slowly. Right. There's but, a Senate uh, confirmation before we started process. the show, you said that bringing an ambassador into the country is quite a complicated mm. and detailed process could you talk it is about that it's well it's exciting um because you've got the you've got anticipation on the host government side um and people asking a lot of questions they want to know everything that they can know about um you know the the, the incoming um ambassador designate and of right. course they're not only asking the embassy they've got history and then when it's a prominent person like um, uh, the current no uh, nominee, um, you know, they, they, there's a lot of information out there. So, you know, there's the information gathering process of, you know, what's this going to be like? Who's this person? What, their, what are their interests and how will that impact our relationship? Um, but inside the, inside the mission as well, um, I can say that, you know, we're working with our colleagues in Washington to ensure that um, the ambassador designate has 
the latest and the the best information that we've gathered um, about our relationship with Japan, so that when he goes before Congress um, for his um, for his testimony, um, he is on for all of the issues and um, is aware of um, all of the things that uh, we're tackling in this bilateral relationship. Um, the other thing is that it's just exciting to have a new leader coming in. Mm -hmm. And so people are, you know, thinking about in each section, thinking about, you know, who will be the priority contacts for um, the, the ambassador, the new ambassador to meet when, when he arrives. Um, so that that is, you know, what is occupying people now is the preparation. Um, and of course, once he's on, on, on the ground, then it will be implementing all those great plans. You know, you want him to meet these people first and foremost um, and, and, and arranging for those meetings and then uh, preparing um, for, for those engagements um, is really important um, to, to make sure that the ambassador gets off to the best start uh, possible. In, in, yeah. the, in carrying out the, the president's um, uh, priorities in our policy in Japan. Right. And we're running, we only have a minute left. I, I imagine one of the things he's probably studying or your, the State Department people are preparing for is the fact that we have a new government here mm. in, in Japan. We have a new, pri well, not new government, a new prime minister. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who uh, will put a different spin on, on things, I would imagine. So there's probably uh, information about him because he's certainly a known I would imagine candidate. That. He was on his right hand man for or one of his uh, top assistants for quite a while. I would imagine that there is quite a bit of, um, of, of, of thought uh, on both sides, um, you know, about the relationship between the two leaders. Um, one of the the features of the U.S. Japan relationship is that it it has it has evolved to a very a highly personalized relationship. Oh, I see. Right. Um, you know, people still talk about the Ron Yasu yeah. friendship during well, President Reagan. Exactly. And yeah. so that that relationship. I mean, how, what's that personal chemistry going to be like? The, um, you know, the U.S.-Japan relationship is, you know, is stable and um, it has endured over the past 70 some odd years. Um, but that personal interaction is something that even now people look at and, and, and say, you know, if that if it, if it clicks, if there is, you know, chemistry, if they get along personally, that mm -hmm. bodes well for the bilateral relationship as well. All right, Karen. Well, well, we'll have to end on that. Unfortunately, we can easily talk for uh, another hour about your experience. We can. Your we didn't talk about the Kansai at all. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't, I, you're just a wonderful guest, Karen. <laughs> but thank you so you're much. You're a great host. You're a great host. Oh, yeah. Well, I try, I just try to be quiet. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you for uh, the viewers who have tuned in, and those of you who are going to see this uh, when it's posted up on the Think Tech website. If you enjoyed this uh, promotion, the show, uh, please uh, contribute to the Think Tech effort. Uh, I know the uh, managers of the uh, Think Tech organization, which is a nonprofit organization, would appreciate that very much. And again, Karen, it was it was just so wonderful to see you again. You great look great. to see you too. Uh, yeah, Thank continue you. Success to you, and please come back to Japan. You know the the COVID rates have gone down here significantly, so hopefully uh, the quarantines will go down too. I All hope right. so too. Yep. Thank you so right. much. Thank you for Stay watching. Safe.